All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, we're gonna to talk about this. An Anderson Manufacturing AM15 Utility Pro chambered in 5.56. This is actually the revival of an old series on the channel, that being the Friendly Fire series, in which I discuss guns out of other people's collections in order to remove my purchase bias, but then apply my thought processes and evaluations to somebody else's gun and or setup, something that I may not necessarily buy or configure that way myself. Now, in the Friendly Fire series, we will go over the features of this rifle, how it shoots, all that kind of stuff, get into my recommendations, whether or not I would buy it, changes that I would make, and then also competitive offerings out on the market. Let's go ahead and get started off with a little bit of background. Anderson Manufacturing is not a terribly historic manufacturer. However, they are a manufacturer of budget AR-15 parts. And as many parts manufacturers have done, they've also started producing their own rifles out of their parts. Now, there's a lot of controversy that swirls around Anderson manufacturing lower receivers in that like there's some quality control issues and stuff like that. I have built an AR-15 off of an Anderson lower before. That would be my Mark 12 Mod Murph, which if you're interested in that, the link to the original and update videos will be in the description. Links will be in the description. And I had no issue with that. However, I will say that I prefer to purchase already assembled lowers, which this rifle kind of falls in that category at that point. Now, the personal history with this rifle might be a little bit more interesting in this case. A coworker of mine had signed up for a course with a couple of his friends, and he had an issue. He didn't own a rifle at that point. It was going to be a two-gun, a rifle pistol course that he was going to. He knew about this many months in advance, and he'd been kind of shopping around, not really, and I was kind of supposed to be keeping an eye out for deals and wasn't doing a very good job of that either. It was getting very close to the course, and I offered for him to borrow some of my guns in order to be able to go to the course. Now, normally, I don't offer for people to borrow my guns. However, I felt that he would take good care of my stuff, which is a huge thing for me whenever it comes to borrowing guns, be it me loaning them out or me borrowing guns from somebody else. These are not insignificant investments of your personal hard-earned money. So... I am very careful about how it is that I take care of other people's things, and I have come to learn that I cannot hold that expectation for every other person as well. So I try to take care of my things. I expect other people to take care of my things, just like I would take care of their things like they were my own. It's kind of a respect thing overall, and I don't necessarily trust everyone to, ha to hold that value. However, he declined borrowing my firearms, which I understand completely. And at about that point, I got an email from Primary Arms stating that they had these guns on sale. I sent him the link. He asked me my opinion of it. I relayed some concerns that I had, but overall gave it a good endorsement. And he wound up purchasing it. He took it to the course. He ran about 500 rounds through it. And then he offered it to me for review on the channel. So here we are now. All right, guys. That pretty much covers background. Why don't we go ahead and get into the features of this particular rifle. Right at the bat, we have an A2 flash hider with the ports on the top and the closed off bottom. This way you don't have any gases venting downwards that might disturb, you know, dirt, sand, dust, brush, whatever. That could potentially give your position away if you're firing in the prone position. Most people consider these to be more or less glorified thread protectors. I'm not bothered by flash hiders in general, in the A2 especially. I prefer flash hiders over muzzle compensating because I mean we're talking about 556 rifles these are not that heavy recoiling to begin with that I feel like I need the additional recoil reduction which I guess if you're trying to build like a race rifle or something along those lines yeah sure that's a consideration for the average person especially if you're talking about a defensive rifle a compensator is not very helpful so of course this is easily removable and you can add whatever muzzle device it is that you would like to run I also don't have suppressors so I don't need like a specific suppressor mount or anything like that to be able to suppress the guns, but you might have that consideration. This barrel is a 16 inch 4150 chrome molly vanadium one and eight twist nitrided government profile barrel. All right, so let's break down a couple of things from there. The one and eight twist. I have been a long time advocate for the one and eight twist. I like that it's a good middle ground between the one and nine and one and seven, which means that it can stabilize the larger projectiles you would commonly associate with the one and seven twist and also the lighter weight bullets that you would commonly associate with the one and nine twist. In this case, meaning that it'll get better accuracy stability out of those, out of those rounds. It's not necessarily like, you know, 77s are going to tumble in a one and nine twist. 
I, they could potentially, but they're not necessarily going to tumble in a one in nine twist. But 55 grain in a one in seven may not necessarily give you the best accuracy results. A one in eight is supposed to be that middle ground. And someone pointed out a while ago that the average person is just going to shoot 55 and 62 grain ammunition. It really doesn't matter what twist rate they use at that point. And they're right. They're absolutely right in that case. But being a YouTube gun reviewer, I am addressing a much wider audience. And while the average person purchasing this rifle is probably not running out and buying 77 grain OTMs, if somebody was looking to make this their base rifle for future uses to upgrade it as they went, which we'll get into that more here after a bit, then they might like the utility of a 1 in 8 twist. And that might be something that they want to take into consideration whenever it is that they're making their choices. All right, I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on the barrel itself. This is a carbine length gas system. The carbine length gas system is the more reliable gas system. However, it's also the more punchy gas system. Is that a big issue to the average person? No, not really. I do prefer a mid-length gas system because I like the, the smoother recoil impulse that allows me to stay on target better, but I train around a lot of carbine length gas systems, so it's not like I don't have them in my collection. I run them professionally, but regardless. Let's not spend too much more time on that. This handguard. This handguard was actually the issue I had with this rifle. So this is a 15 inch handguard, M-lock, and it has no anti-rotation tabs. And that is a no-go for me. Anti-rotation tabs are a minimum requirement on an AR-15 handguard. Now, the, you can see here we have a very small Picatinny section up here near the muzzle where the owner has installed a sling swivel. And then also he's been running this rail cover with, I mean, at least how I've been using it is just something to kind of build up my grip around the rifle and kind of a touch point as well. I'm pretty sure he uses it for the same. He's not a big fan because he doesn't have Picatinny rail going all the way across the top so he can mount whatever it is, wherever it is that he wants to on this particular rail. I dislike it because of the anti-rotation tabs. Either way, both of us dislike this rail. Also, it feels cheap. The anodizing on this rail is just, this almost feels like paint. Like, it, it, this is not... I do not care for this rail at all. We'll talk about that more as we go. This optic is the MRO from Trichcon, which, you know, this is actually the first time that I've ever worked around the MRO, and I had heard some not so positive things about the MRO without having ever experienced one myself. And I've got to say, I was actually really surprised by this optic. So I have a bit of an astigmatism, and even though I like red dots, I do have a tendency to get some blooming out of red dots whenever it is that I look through them. But this is actually a fairly crisp dot. I was very pleasantly surprised by that. So uh, the MRO is something I'm going to have to take a little bit more seriously and spend some more time looking into. Now, he, this is a used optic that he's buying off of a friend. This is also that same friend's LaRue riser which brings this up to a one-third co-witness for the iron sights we don't have more about that here in a minute you can see here it's a qd mount it's a pretty nice setup he's uh he's actually getting a really good deal on that optic and setup combination all right now long time viewers of the channel know what it is that i'm going to talk about when it comes to the receiver the ar-15 and like my minimum requirements and all that kind of stuff so if you've seen it in my ar-15 reviews before go ahead Check the description, go to the chapter section, jump to content that you actually want to consume. As for the rest of you, forward assist. The forward assist is a minimum requirement for me on an AR-15. A lot of people are ardently against the forward assist. Eugene Soner didn't want the rifle to have a forward assist. The forward assist is only going to cause more harm than good. When have you ever used a forward assist? And I can tell you that I've used a forward assist quite frequently. So I don't, I don't know where we go in this conversation now. Generally, I use a forward assist whenever it is that I come off of some sort of administrative function, especially in dry environments where I've worked before. So you do like a little, a little press check or something like that before you step up to the line at a course of fire or a competition or something like that. And then tap the forward assist real quick just to make sure the bolt made it all the way in the battery because a click, no bang in any type of situation is not what you want. The important thing to remember about the forward assist it's just like any other tool or technique, everything has a time and a place. If you have gunk or something like that built up in the chamber and you're trying to match that forward assist to get that round into the chamber, you're messing up. That's not a good idea. Stop that. 
One size fit all solutions don't really have a place in this. This is a thinking man's game. I just conducted a press check. Possibly the bolt's not all the way in the battery. I go ahead and hit the Ford Assist. I'm going bang, 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 and all of a sudden it's not going bang anymore. The Ford Assist may not necessarily help me in this case. I might need to go into immediate action, and if immediate action doesn't work, then I might need to go into remedial action at that point and actually diagnose what the problem is. This is not a reset button. This is not an easy button. This is something that has a time and a place just like anything else. All right, enough about that. The brass deflector, huge fan of the brass deflector. This is also a minimum requirement for me. I sometimes do cross shoulder shooting and stuff like that. I don't wanna eat brass to the face. So brass deflector is a sustain. The dust cover, the dust cover is also a minimum requirement for me whenever I have the dust cover closed whenever it is that I'm not actively shooting the rifle in order to protect the internals of the rifle from the ingress of foreign material. I've been to a lot of courses. I've been to like small arms master marksmanship and stuff like that, where that was a gradable step whenever it is that you were going through your evaluations was the closure of the dust cover whenever it is that you were done doing all the other stuff that you were supposed to do. Everything ended off with close the dust cover. All right, these are 7075T6 aluminum upper and lowers. This is a T70, 75 T6 loom upper and lower is the better way to say that. We have a single-sided magazine release. We have a single-sided bolt release, a little ping pong paddle there. We have a single-sided safety. I'm a big fan of single-sided safeties. I've never cared for an ambidextra safety. So the other side has a tendency to irritate my grip and it gets on my nerves. I had my original training around single-side safeties. So utilizing this portion of my hand in order to actuate the safety get down on the trigger and then curving it back to take it off safe has never been an issue for me personally. All right, our bolt. Let's see here. I actually forgot to look up what the bolt material is, but I can tell you that this is not chrome lined. It looks like a pretty simple bolt. Like I would be, I'll annotate down below what the material is if I'm able to find it, but this doesn't look like it's like Carpenter 158 or anything along those lines. We do have proper staking it could stand to be a little bit better but material does deform all the way back to the gas to the screws holding in the gas key so can't be too mad about that our trigger is a standard mil spec trigger something i will say for this trigger is that you're pretty much on the wall. There's not a lot of take up or anything like that. It's not exactly a single stage, but you're more or less on a fairly stiff wall and it just takes a little bit of energy to overcome it. So it's not the greatest trigger in the world. It's also not the worst mil spec that I've ever felt. This is an A2 pistol grip with the A2 bump and longtime viewers of the channel know that I am not a fan of the A2 bump. I absolutely can't stand it, it irritates my grip, it has a tendency to create a hot spot between my fingers and I've dremeled all of mine off of my personal rifles. We have a standard receiver extension. We have a standard AR-15 buttstock with one little addition. It does have a QD point, which I really like that. In general, I'm not bothered by the standard AR-15 stock. It's fairly narrow profile, which makes it easy to work around body armor. It's easy enough for me to be able to find the pocket and all that kind of thing. I prefer kind of minimalist stocks. I've never been a big fan of like the SOP mod or anything along those lines. So this stock does more or less what it is that I think that it should do. Our charging handle, our charging handle is a standard AR-15 charging handle. I'm not bothered by these unless I have a magnified optic because at that point, if I'm working around the objective housing, I might want a little bit more surface area to grab onto, but like ambidextrous or oversized charging handles, that's the only time that I really want those. I've never had an issue where I didn't feel like I could get enough contact with the charging handle in order to be able to overcome a malfunction and I utilize my bolt release for reloads. So this really doesn't get used that much except for like administrative tasks, showing clear and stuff like that. All right, guys. That's features. How does it shoot? Thank you. 
I had an interesting time shooting this rifle. So I was there uh, the first day I went out with the owner of this rifle and all that kind of stuff. Um, we both shot it. He ran a couple of mags through it and then I started working on accuracy testing. Maybe that was not setting the rifle up for success with accuracy testing because the government profile is a fairly lightweight barrel and you know, perhaps that kind of skewed the day one results a little bit there. However, I watched him zero this at 25 yards and then I got a hold of it and I started running it and I started shooting it. And what I found was that I would get four shots relatively close together, but the fifth shot would go wide and would go wide enough to go off a of paper. And in addition to that, at 100 yards, the rifle was grouping low which with a 25 yard zero at 100 yards, unless I've missed my math, the rifle should be shooting above the point of aim. So that confused me all by itself. And it made me start to wonder if we were having a condition of zero shift with the barrel having heated up. Subsequent range sessions would show that the rifle was still consistently hitting low, however. I did finally manage to get a group together. It took me a while in which I shot some Scorpion 55 grain FMJ and got this seven and three eighths inch group. Now out of this rifle, I shot the Scorpion. I shot Barnall and I shot Wolf. None of these are necessarily match grade ammunition. None of it should be bringing in like super amazing accuracy, but I would not, I am not too thrilled about the accuracy result on this particular rifle. Okay, Murph, well that's accuracy shooting. Did you do any type of dynamic shooting with it? Because with this rail and this barrel, this rifle is very lively in the hands. It is very light. It's very easy to be able to transition with and all that kind of stuff. I really like the handling characteristics of this rifle, which is no surprise to anybody who's been watching the channel for a while. You guys know that I like light, handy rifles. So I did do some ready up drills with this rifle and I found it very comfortable to work with. I really enjoyed doing those ready ups with it. I overall like the handling of this rifle. I just have some accuracy concerns. All right, what about recommendations, Murph? What recommendations would you make in conjunction with this rifle? And here's an important caveat here. When we review rifles on the channel for the Friendly Fire series, we review them in the recommendation section based on how they are configured. In this case, we're leaving out a caveat of the sling because the owner does have a sling. He just didn't give it to me when I picked up the rifle from him. Would I recommend this for duty use? Absolutely not. We have no iron sights. We have no backup sighting system in general, and we do not have a light on this gun. We're giving him a caveat on the sling. He has a sling, he just didn't give it to me. I know he doesn't have those other parts. I would not recommend this for duty use because of that. Okay, well, what about home defense, self-defense? <sighs> We're talking about self-defense, like taking this as a truck gun. Like, sure, it's an AR-15 with a collapsible stock. I can get it pretty short, but it's still a little longer than what I would want to negotiate inside of like the cab of a truck. And for home defense, if all I'm doing is covering my bedroom door, yes, I would utilize this for home defense. If I have to break cover in order to go secure a family member, like a child or something like that, I would not recommend this gun for home defense because I do not have a light. And if we're potentially going through the dark house and stuff like that, we need to be able to identify our target. So this is a, this is a, a kind of back and forth. It's very situationally dependent, so it's a yes, but also a no. 
And for most people, especially the owner, since he's got a baby on the way, this is going to be a no-go when it comes to home defense rifle. Okay, well, what about a competition rifle? Now, in this case, this rifle kind of gets a soft recommendation. I have not been in a competition where I had to rely on a light. And as long as he stays on top of the batteries, he shouldn't necessarily need a backup sighting system. So I could see this working in a you know two-gun or three-gun type competition, especially as long as the shots stay close, because I do have some concerns about this accuracy-wise out to distance. Okay, well, what about as a hunting rifle? With this optic setup, I'm not as in love with this as a hunting rifle. I could see this for varmint, maybe for like pig eradication and stuff like that, but it would not be a first choice in those regards. It could work, especially on the pig eradication because that's already kind of like fast paced shooting as it is. And when we're talking about like eradication, a lot of guys are running AR-15s in 5.56, 300 blackout, 6.5 Grendel, stuff like that. Okay, well, what about as a woods gun? Well, I wouldn't necessarily take this thing hiking, but if you're going to be bebopping around, you know, your property or your homestead or something like that, and you're going to throw this across the back of your truck or on, a, on an ATV or, uh, you know, anything along those lines, and you wanted this available to be able to take pot shots or handle some type of varmint of the two or four legged variety, whichever it may be, I think this rifle would be applicable for that as long as you're not doing it at night. Because again, no light. You're going to really stand on that. Hey, put a light on this. All right, guys, those are my recommendations. Would I buy this? And the answer is no. And it's purely because of the handguard. I can find plenty of rifles. If I'm going to buy a rifle, I, I want it to have a lot of the features that I want it to have that, that are my minimum requirements because those are my minimum requirements, which for the video on my minimum requirements for AR-15s, go ahead and check the link in the description. So this handguard alone would knock this rifle out of consideration. Okay, Murph, you recommended this to somebody, so would you recommend it to anybody else a second time? And the answer is yes. And that's because of something that I talked about in my build versus buy a video, which if you're interested in that, link in the description. This is the type of rifle that if you're someone who's like, not necessarily got all the money in the world, you could pick up and you could grow with it. The owner of this gun is a bit of a thrifty fellow to begin with, but he also has a baby on the way, so he doesn't have money to just throw around. He picked something that he could afford and that he could grow with. And I think that's really important, especially whenever it is that you're talking about your first AR-15. Get something that you can afford, and then as you go to courses, as you go to competitions, as you work on your skill and all that kind of stuff, you're gonna identify things over time that you're like, man, I really wish this was different. I really wish I had this. I really wish I had this or that or the other thing. And then you're gonna make those changes to this rifle to make it better suited to your purposes. And that's okay. That's beautiful, really. All right, well, then what changes would you make to this rifle, Murph? Well, I can tell you that in regards to the owner, the immediate change that I would make, and I, I'm fairly confident he's going to do this, is to swap out this handguard. I was looking around at, you know, like sales and stuff like that, and I found a UTG Pro handguard that is made in the 15-inch variety that I think would be a great replacement of this handguard. Would you have him replace the barrel, Murph? I don't think he has to run out and replace the barrel right now. I think it's more important that he go ahead and get a worthwhile rail on this thing. But I do think the barrel is something that needs to be in his, in his long-term goals at this point. So this is immediate, this needs to happen right now. This is more like a 100 meter target. 50 meter target, 100 meter target type of deal. Like as I go through, as he shoots this a little bit more, gets, gets his money's worth out of this barrel and then swaps it out for something that I think is gonna be a little bit better. All right, so those are the changes that, those are the near-term changes that I think he should make in addition to adding iron sights and a flashlight. What changes would you make, Murph? Well, obviously I would add iron sights and a flashlight, but I would go a little bit of a different direction with this rifle. Since, I'm, I, since to me, I feel like this whole section of the gun needs to get replaced, I would go ahead and pop that same UTG Pro but in a nine inch rail on here, and I would put in the ten, a 10.3 inch Faxon pencil weight barrel. And I picked the 10.3 inch Faxon barrel because it is a carbine length gas system, so I would be able to retain the gas block and gas tube of this particular rifle in conjunction with 
that Faxon barrel, and then I would SBR this. Which long-term viewers of the channel know that I'm a huge fan of SBRs. I have several. I plan on adding more to the collection, and I've massively been wanting a 10.3 kind of Mark 18 inspired build. So that is what I would wind up doing with this rifle if it were me. All right, so there's whether or not I would buy it and what changes I would make. What are some competitive offerings out on the market? And this is something that I actually found kind of interesting. In the budget AR-15 market, this style of handguard without the uh, anti-rotation tabs seems to be the norm. And I'm very confused by this because, you know, one of the things with the 1 and 8 twist and like the 4150 chrome molly vanadium steel barrel, there are barrels out there that are 4140, that are 1 and 9 twist, right? And you could buy those and they're going to perform just fine for you. Most people are not going to shoot out a 4140 barrel. However, the 4150 barrels are not that much more expensive, if not the same price, and are objectively better barrels. A 1 in 9 twist barrel might be the same price as the 1 in 8 twist barrel, but the 1 in 8 is technically more versatile for not that much more or no additional cost. And that's the same kind of thing whenever it is that we're talking about non-anti-rotation -ro tab handguards. A rotation tab is not that much more money. It's not like it's some sort of crazy wizardry that jacks up the cost of the rifle. It really doesn't. It's just two little metal taps. Somewhere that interface with the top of this receiver so that the handguard doesn't turn when you don't want it to. And they're not that much more expensive, if not the same price. So I don't understand why that's not more of a standard. And I think it's because they assume that most people don't care. I do though. So looking around, PSA does have offerings out there that have that actually come in below the cost of the MSRP of this rifle with anti-rotation tabs. And in fact, a lot of they also have like the Blem offerings, which are guns that are not in some way mechanically impaired, just for whatever reason, there's some sort of minor aesthetic imperfection that they decided to sell at a much cheaper price that they couldn't sell for full price. So you get something like that, and you're actually beating the MSRP of this particular rifle at the base level. Going off of PSA, I was looking around, I was having trouble finding anything else that had anti-rotation tabs, so at this point I settled on the Smith & Wesson MP15 Sport 3, which now has a 15-inch M-Lock handguard that looks an awful lot like this one. I would get that rifle and then I would swap out that handguard if I was looking at competitive options. I'm like, Murph, well, you know, now we're adding the cost of the rail, but here's the deal. If you get the gun cheap enough Making those types of changes isn't that big of a deal because there are going to be certain inherent costs associated with the rifle to begin with. So take this rifle, for instance. Owner picked it up with the parts that I picked out, that I went ahead and priced out. That would come in at just over 250 additional dollars. He would still be coming in under the MSRP of the Smith & Wesson MP15 Sport 3 with that stuff changed out. Now, someone might say, well, Murph, what about tax? What about shipping? What about background check? And all that kind of stuff. But guys, those are the cost of doing business. I do not roll those into the cost of the rifle. That's no different than like, you know, the gas that it took for me to go and pick up the gun or something along those lines. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not nitpicking those things and rolling them into the cost of the overall rifle. Oh, well, you know, I was out and then I picked up lunch. So I'm gonna add that to the cost of the rifle. No, that's not, that's not how this works. I consider those the cost of doing business. Same thing with if we go my route and I do the tax stamp. Well, Murph, you gotta add that $200, you know, now you're up over the cost of the MP15 Sport 3. But I don't consider that to be a part of it. It's a tax. It's the cost of doing business in this case. You know, and then like, well, Murph, what about the optics and the lights and, and you know, the iron sights that you wanna add? That's the price that you have to pay in order to have a rifle that's ready to fight. So I don't consider those to be a part of the base rifle. Those are add-ons. They definitely play into the cost of the gun, but it's like a separate pot of money is how I look at it. If he just swaps out this handguard and keeps this barrel for a little while longer, he's looking at a under $100 investment, which is still bringing this thing in well below the MP Sport 3. Or in this case, if we're talking about the MP Sport 3, it's still coming in below a Springfield Armory Saint or anything along those lines, with that just minor upgrade that is a really good upgrade. And then you add your optics and your lights and you know sling swivels and all that kind of stuff. All 
All right, guys. Oh, I almost forgot. There's one more little thing we need to look over. And that is a small internal problem with the rifle. Something that I discovered while cleaning this gun was that the buffer retaining pin has bent a little bit. So when this bolt is not in the gun, this buffer extends enough into the upper receiver that it keeps me from being able to shotgun the rifle like we see here. So I actually have to get a tool in there, push this back enough to be able to pop the upper receiver or hinge the upper receiver. <coughs> That's definitely uh, kind of gives a little bit of cred uh, credence to the, um, the QC issues that people talk about with Anderson Manufacturing. However, I went ahead and secured a replacement pin for that, which I got for free at my local gun shop because the dude was like, yeah, dude, I've got like a hundred of these lying around. Just go ahead and take it. So yeah, that's a, that's a minor inconvenience. It does not affect the function of the rifle. It's just annoying whenever it is that you're cleaning it. And a replacement is readily available and easy to do. So I would not consider that to be the super big negative thing whenever it is that it comes to this rifle. It's just something to be aware of. All right, guys. I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you guys found this interesting, and that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day. I'm honestly one of MP5. This shit feels so nice. There's like no recoil on them. Feels like. Huh? Yeah. You sound that good?